Welcome to the Travel Squad Podcast, where adventure meets inspiration. We're your hosts. I'm Brittany. I'm Kim. And I'm Jamal. Together, we explore international destinations, hike epic national parks, and share unforgettable travel experiences with you, one passport stamp at a time. Our mission is to inspire you to travel by showing you how you can make it work no matter your budget, schedule, or experience level. We bring you along so that you can laugh, get excited, and start planning your own trip. So grab your ticket and your passport. And don't forget your travel insurance. And get ready to embark on a new adventure with us around the globe. Hello, fellow travelers. Hey, squaddies. Hey, squaddies. Welcome to this week's episode of the Travel Squad podcast. Today, we are talking all about UNESCO World Heritage Sites, specifically in the U.S. to visit. And I'm really excited about today's episode because we've had previous episodes on international UNESCO sites, but this episode is going to focus only on the U.S. sites. And I think a lot of you realized when we did the last episode that you've been to a few of them and not really even known that they were UNESCO sites. So I'm sure there's been some in the U.S. that you've visited, maybe didn't realize they were UNESCO sites, and we're going to be covering 14 of them. There are 24 UNESCO sites in the U.S., but we're going to be covering the ones that we've actually been to in this episode. And I love UNESCO sites, and I think I could safely speak for the squad here when I say we all love UNESCO sites and have an appreciation for them. So this episode is almost like a 2.0, but here in the U.S., like Brittany was saying, So we're really going to dive into that of those 14 that we've been to. And if you haven't listened to the previous UNESCO World Heritage Site episode that we did, talking about the international ones, etc., just as a little reminder, UNESCO stands for United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. And basically, the United Nations comes together and pretty much decides what is UNESCO heritage sites. And the judging criteria for that, and this is in quotes, they have to contain cultural and natural heritage around the world that's considered to be of outstanding value to humanity. So here in the United States, we have 24 places and things that are deemed to have outstanding value to humanity. And those can either be you know, cultural or specifically environmental or natural in that way. And we're obviously going to discuss that a little bit more, the difference between the two and what those are. I'm actually surprised that there's only 24 in the U.S. Yeah, well, there is actually a list of ones that are on like the contingency list. So there could be more in the future. But as of right now, during this recording, only 24. They're the reserves on backup. We got the reserves on backup. So there may be more than 24 years soon. And you know what's really interesting is I've heard this before and I tried to Google it to verify it, but I really couldn't find anything that specifically said it, but I'm pretty sure that this is true. If there is ever war in a location where there are UNESCO World Heritage Sites, it's technically a war crime to bomb, destroy, or do anything around it because once all is said and done, they want these things to be preserved. So that's how important they really are. It's like considered war crimes to really mess with these things. Not to say that that hasn't happened before, but it's a war crime technically. That is incredibly interesting. And, you know, as we're talking about them, we're building them up to seem like these exclusive, hard to find, have to know it to get into it type places. But the truth is, you squatties have probably been to UNESCO World Heritage Sites and maybe not even known that they were one. There's nothing really at these sites that I've ever seen that says this is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. If anything, there might be like a placard somewhere and maybe I missed it. But there's not like this grand fireworks going off like you've made it, they're here. So I think though, when you know that it is one and you go into it, it kind of feels a little bit more special when you're there. So I'm excited to dive into this episode because they are right under our noses, right at our fingertips and... There are 24 in the U.S., but we're only going to go over 14 today, so you know we're going to have a part two, maybe even a part three when those reserves come up to bat. Yeah, and with that, I mean, let's dive right into it, Kim. You said you're kind of excited. Number one is a place that I know you were excited to really, really go to, kind of considered ancient ruins here to some degree in the United States. We know (laughs) those get your juices flowing, Kim, so why don't you lead us into number one? Number one is Mesa Verde National Park in Colorado, in the southwest corner of Colorado, to be specific. 
And it's really well known for its Pueblo cliff dwellings. And they're super well preserved. We actually went on a squad trip last year, last August. Our friend Robin came with us and we were able to do some tours of the cliff dwellings and they were amazing. I loved like being enriched in that culture and being able to see the cliff dwellings, hear about the people that live there, learn about the history of the park in that area. And it's amazing that thriving communities were built on the side of these cliffs. It's really mind blowing when we were there to actually see it. And like I was saying earlier, you know, they're either cultural or natural designations, right? And Mesa Verde here is a cultural designation because these are remnants of the ancient Native American civilizations, how they lived, how they had communities, maybe even, dare I say, cities, because even though some of the dwelling locations were large, I mean, they're not city large, but they had enough of these dwellings concentrated in one area that it was its own community, almost really like a city. Mesa Verde falls into that cultural category. And for anybody who goes overseas to international locations and sees ancient ruins, buildings, etc., I feel like in the United States specifically, because you could go North America, Mexico and find certain things, but in the United States specifically, I feel like this is really the only location that we still see historic things that we could maybe almost consider temples, even though they're not temples, but like carved into stones and literally on the edge of the cliff. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the things you can do there. But if you want to hear the whole thing, go back to episode 192 and listen to our dedicated episode on Mesa Verde National Park. I know earlier I was just saying there's nothing that really lights up and announces that you're at a UNESCO World Heritage Site. But when you roll up on this place, it will feel like that. It is one of the coolest things, I think, in the U.S. that I've ever seen here. They're so well-preserved and so unlike anything I've ever seen before. And I'd been so anticipating going to this place for so long that if you had to go to only one place on this list, I am putting my foot down. This is the one for me. Whoa, big, bold statement there. Bold Anthony. statement. I actually met a landscape photographer, and he said that out of all of the national parks in the U.S. national park system, he believes Mesa Verde National Park is our most photogenic national park in the U.S. And I can totally see mm-hmm. that after visiting. And while we were there, they have tons of different cliff dwelling tours. While we were there, we were there for two days, and we were able to do three different tours. We did Cliff Palace, which is the first tour that we did. We did a long house, which was one of the biggest sites that we saw. And then we saw a balcony house, which we had to climb up. And it was really cool because it feels like you're on a balcony. There's a balcony, you look out and there's this grand, beautiful view. And it's hard for me to pick which one was my favorite. But I really say I think it would be between a long house and balcony house. But that's just mine. Oh, for me, hands down, Balcony House. That was just so cool to be able to climb up those super tall ladders on the side of the cliff and walk through those tiny little doors. You have to like kind of crawl through them and that we thought it was a window. It's actually their doors. So that was the other really cool thing about this place is that, yes, it is a UNESCO World Heritage Site and so well preserved. But they still let you walk in there and give you that up close and personal experience that not a lot of preserved ancient ruins will let you do. And what's really great about it too is like you were saying, Kim, you could get all up in there and really be in it versus just looking at it to appreciate it. But it's not just a free for all. You have to actually get specific tours, pay tickets for them, which they're not very expensive, but they really regulate how many people go through there to actually preserve these locations and cliff dwellings. So you need to go and make sure that you have your reservations for these tours if you want to actually go ahead and do it. You could still go to the park. Some of them are accessible just from viewpoints to see, but it's not the same as getting in there. So even though it's a national park, it's not like a lot of them here in the U.S. that we're used to where you can just go do whatever you want. It's really regulated. So if you're planning on going, which you should, Kim, say number one, a big, bold statement. It's high up there on my list. I don't know about number one, but high, high up there. But yes, do your research, make sure you get those reservations and go back and listen to our episode on it to get more information all about this awesome national park and UNESCO World Heritage Site. Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. With the price of just about everything going up during inflation, we thought we'd bring our prices 
down. So to help us, we brought in a reverse auctioneer, which is apparently a thing. Mint Mobile Unlimited Premium Wireless. Ready to get 30, 30, ready to get 30, ready to get 20, 20, 20, ready to get 20, 20, ready to get 15, 15, 15, 15, just 15 bucks a month. So give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front for three months plus taxes and fees. Promote for new customers for limited time. Unlimited more than 40 gigabytes per month. Slows. Full terms at mintmobile.com. Hey, squaddies. We want to share one of our favorite travel products with you. Liquid IV is a category winning hydration brand fueling your well-being while traveling. One stick fits into 16 ounces of water to give you three times the electrolytes of traditional sports drinks and hydrates you two times faster than water alone. Their half-ounce hydration multiplier powder packet is the one product you need in every suitcase, carry-on, and day pack. We use it while flying on planes because flights can be so dehydrating. We use it when we feel jet-lagged, when we're out on a hike, and after a long night out that has us feeling worn out. In just one stick, you get five essential vitamins, B3, B5, B6, B12, and vitamin C. Liquid IV also now comes in 12 delicious and refreshing flavors to keep your hydration routine exciting. Our favorites are the lemon lime and tangerine with immune support. It's made with premium ingredients, all non-GMO and gluten, dairy, and soy free. Get 20% off when you go to liquidiv.com and use Travel Squad Podcast at checkout. That's 20% off anything you order when you shop better hydration today using promo code Travel Squad Podcast at liquidiv.com. Hey, squaddies, let's take a quick detour to talk about our travel itineraries that we've created just for you. We just launched several new international trip itineraries, including Tulum and Japan. This is on top of the itineraries we already have for U.S. trips like the Hawaiian Island of Kauai, the U.S. Virgin Islands, as well as national park trip itineraries including Utah's Mighty Five National Parks and a week at Grand Teton and Yellowstone. These fully built out 20 to 30 page PDF guides are available for instant download on our site right now. Every detail of the trip is laid out for you. So all you have to do is download, book, show up and have fun. The itineraries tell you where to fly into, the exact route to take, where to stay, park entrance prices, where to eat, driving distance between attractions, the things to see and do, even the hikes we recommend, their mileage, and the time to allot for each one. And believe it or not, so much more. Be sure to head over to TravelSquadPodcast.com to download your very own comprehensive travel itinerary today. So number two on our list is actually a UNESCO World Heritage site that Jamal and I just visited. And Jamal just visited for the first time just in August of 2023. And it is Independence Hall in Philadelphia. I actually went when I was in high school, so I've seen Independence Hall before, but this was Jamal's first time and our first time together. And when you do visit Independence Hall, you do have to have a reservation for a tour. The tour is about a 20 to 25 minute tour, and it's only a dollar per person. And you just have to reserve the spot on recreation.gov. But this is Jamal's like wheelhouse. Jamal loves history. He's our historian. He's our educator on historical matter. (laughs) So Jamal, why don't you dive into Independence Hall and what you enjoyed about your visit there? Well, I really loved Independence Hall. And Independence Hall falls under the cultural aspect of a UNESCO designation, right? So there's nothing natural about it. It's not any nature aspect. This is cultural specifically American culture, but at the same time, you can say culture for the world because of America's place in it at this point in time, right? And Independence Hall, if you don't know what it looks like, flip to the back of a $100 bill and you're going to see Independence Hall. And what it is, is the location where all representatives of government of the 13 colonies met to create a document declaring independence, of course, from Great Britain, which headed off the War for Independence Uh, an American revolution in the 1700s that made us the country that we are today. On top of that, not a lot of people even realize this, but when we declared independence, I mean, we weren't just a country, we had to fight for it, but a lot of times people think the Constitution also. Well, the Constitution wasn't signed well after the war in which we won for our independence, and they met back here at Independence Hall. So even the Constitution was signed and agreed upon here at Independence Hall in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And so as an American history fan and lover, I just appreciated it. As an American, I appreciated it. But 
One of the things that I really like when you're at places like this, and I wouldn't call the people who gave us the tour, you know, rangers like you'll find in national parks, right? But they are to some degree, you know, the rangers. When you're in there, you see the room that they've signed it and tell you stories about what they know happened that day and conversations. And it, you just really have this sense of really grasping, of course, world history has changed in this one spot. And to be there is just a feeling that I really can't describe, but one that just gives you kind of that tingly vibe inside, or so I thought, and I really enjoyed so it. So I have a question because I wasn't there. I'm imagining this looks like the Texas State Capitol that I was just walking around in, like your typical government capital type building. Is that what it's like? It's much, much smaller than that. Really? Right. Well, I mean, if you think about it, when this was signed in the 1700s, we were only colonies and people lived pretty much close to the city center and you didn't have that many representatives of your government. So you're right. As a matter of fact, it's called Independence Hall because we signed it there. But it's actually really the Pennsylvania State House is what it originally is. And they just used the Pennsylvania State House, which is where the legislature was, the court, everything of the colony. And they use that as the location. So you're right in the analogy, but also very wrong in terms of its grandeur. It's very small. But when you're in there, it's exactly what it is to some degree is just really a government building. But of course, when you go there, hear the stories and the appreciation of what really took place there, uh, it becomes a lot more than just that tour of your Texas State House that you just mentioned. That's very cool. Number three on the list for us is going to be Carlsbad Caverns. National Park falling under that natural category. I know that I said number one was my hands down favorite and I stand by that, but I love Carlsbad Cavern. It is really, really cool in the cave. Obviously, that's the main draw of it. But when I visited there, separate from you two, I went in the middle of summer. I think you guys did too. It's in New Mexico. It's barren out there. I even took a picture because it looked like the ocean, except it was just like burnt yellow ground, like no trees, nothing as far as the eye can see. And you're standing and you don't realize that this massive cave and cavern is right underneath you. And it's so beautiful and a complete 180 on the temperature above. Yeah, I know. Inside caves, they were like usually like 55 degrees inside. So it can actually be pretty chilly and like, on the outside, when you're walking up, you're like sweltering, you're hot, you're like trying to take off all your layers. But when you get in those caverns, it gets nice and cool. And I'm not sure which way you went down if you just took the elevator down. So there is two ways to get down into Carlsbad Cavern. One, you could take an elevator down and you're going down hundreds of feet. Or you can actually go through the natural entrance and you pretty much take almost these like switchbacks down and into the natural cave. We actually had two days at Carlsbad Cavern, Jamal and I, for the trip that we went on. So one day we did go down in the elevator and did the tour, and then we walked up the natural entrance. So that was really cool. Those tours are pretty accessible for everyone. We also, the following day, did a guided tour where we had to spelunk down like ladders, and we got to wear the helmets and the headlamps and we crawled around in some dark spaces and got to see parts of the cave that no one else gets to see unless you're on those specific tours. And it's a very small group. But I would highly recommend spending two days in Carlsbad Caverns National Park and doing one of those more specialized tours. If you only have one day and just half a day and just do the main one, you're still going to be impressed. But those more uh, specialized guided tours, that was like a whole nother transformative experience. It really was. And that's one of the cool things that I, it's unfortunate, Kim, because I know when you went, that's when you were on your move to Austin. So you really didn't have a lot of time to explore, do that guided tour with the ranger, right? But what Brittany's mm -hmm. alluding to is just the size of this cavern, right? There's the main cavern that you can go to, again, natural entrance down hiking or taking the elevator. But it's a self-guided. You really see all the stalagmites, the stalactites. They have like a little path. But the cave is so large that they have a lower cave even further below that where the general public can't go. They have to be ranger guided tours. That's where you do the spelunking, the hats with your lights, roping down. 
et cetera. And that is a unique experience. And they're just telling us like how far this really goes back, this cave. And it, it's humbling if you've never been in a cave to just really appreciate the early explorers who went in there, right? I mean, if your light goes out, you're pretty much dead, right? You can't really find your way out, do this and that. And just even beyond the humbling experience of being in the cave, the scenic beauty of what's under the earth, as you put it too, Kim, right? You go out there and it's just the desert and you don't realize below you have this whole ecosystem and environment. And I would wager to say that Carlsbad Caverns is one of my favorite national parks that I've been to and a really solid UNESCO World Heritage Site. My only problem with caves is that they don't photograph well. They do not. Yeah, you need like a professional camera and need to be a professional photographer for to photograph well. For the novice like us, even though we like to think we're good photo takers mm -hmm. for all our traveling and shots that we try to get the perfect ones for, yeah, caves are really difficult to get. But nonetheless, the photo is a memento, but what you keep in your mind, you'll appreciate a lot more from that experience. Yeah, absolutely. And memento, we also have a full episode dedicated to Carlsbad Cavern. If you go all the way back to episode 39, we go into all the detail of the tours that we did and the experience here. So if you're interested, go check that one out. Number four on our list is Everglades in Florida. Everglades National Park. Everglades is, again, one of the, the natural UNESCO World Heritage Sites. And, of course, everyone's probably heard of the Everglades. Maybe you don't know what it is, but it's basically a subtropical wilderness reserve just at the very southern tip of Florida. And you can almost consider it to be really marshland, so to speak, but it's really a low-lying river system that's flowing through, but it's known for its wildlife out there crocodiles, alligators. I think it's the only place in the world where crocodiles and alligators exist in the same environment. That is correct. So yeah, the only place. So if you want to see crocodiles, alligators together, only in the Everglades. And Brittany and I have been to the Everglades, what, two or three times? Definitely twice. Twice. We I went with your was... parents yeah. once, and then we went with Kim once. Okay. I thought maybe there was another time before, but I'm, I couldn't remember uh, when we went without Kim. And so... When we were in Florida, Kim, I mean, I feel so bad because I don't think your Everglades experience was like ours. We were going and in Florida because we were leaving on a squad trip out of Miami and we're like, we have to go to Everglades. Kim hasn't been. And you were really, really excited. And I remember as we were getting close, we're maybe about like 15, <laughs> 20 minutes away. You're like, do you think we're going to see alligators? and crocodiles and i gave you my famous infamous jamal scoff like yeah you were really hyping it up question that is of course we're gonna see them they're all over the place and what oh no why ladies i know and you didn't have a good experience and well yes you had a good experience but not a good one in the sense that we didn't see any crocs or gators right because the time before when Brittany and i had gone i mean they were out in a abundance but we were there in january which is still hot in florida but not excessively hot we were there in September, September, and our guide on the swamp boats that takes us out on the Everglades as you're just gliding across there and doing all that fun stuff, he was telling us, he said, yeah, you know, around this time, and what, it was only 10.30 in the morning, he said, it's already too hot for them. They go and submerge themselves for the day, only come up in the evening. So to see him, you got to be really lucky or have been probably on the boat tour one or two before this one and you would have seen them and so we didn't see any for you but you had that fun experience out there on the water yeah i think i have bad luck with alligators because i also did a tour in new orleans and this was in november so but it was really cold and it was the exact opposite they said it's too cold for the alligators so they go under the water so these damn animals are very temperament you really have to hit them at the right time <laughs> But this national park is really pretty. We got some really great videos. The airboat ride is really fun. And it's still a good experience. We actually did an episode on this one, not fully dedicated to Everglades. We did it on the three national parks in Florida, but heavily touched on Everglades in episode 49. So if you want to hear about that one and also maybe see a few others when you make it out to Everglades, that's a great episode for you. I feel like we've talked about some episodes in this episode that harken way back to the beginning, episode like 39, episode 49. 
And it's crazy to think like where we are now and how many episodes in we are. So kind of fun to hear the progression of the podcast as well. Yeah, like I said in the beginning, you've probably been to some of these places and not even realized they're UNESCO World Heritage Sites. I'm looking at this list and I'm like, damn, is this all we go to or what? Because we've been to like all of them. (laughs) So number five on our list is actually the Statue of Liberty. And that is a cultural UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's located in New York, of course, or actually, is it in New Jersey? I don't know. That's up for debate, right? You know, and (laughs) people may not realize this. There was a whole debate between the state of New York and the state of New Jersey on who the Statue of Liberty actually belonged to. And everyone knows what the Statue of Liberty is. It's just that iconic American symbol, no doubt. But to the point of who it actually belongs to, that was a debate that just really happened and got settled in the courts. Everyone really said that it was belonging to New York, but it's closer to New Jersey. But then everybody said, well, nobody said when they saw the Statue of Liberty coming on the boats that they thought, I'm going to New Jersey, I'm going to New York, right? So technically how they decided it is the land that the Statue of Liberty is on is technically the state of New York, but they've conceded the fact that the Statue of Liberty is in New Jersey water, so they kind of give it to both the states. But it was a long-fought battle to see who it actually belongs to. Kim, you were just in New York this past summer, and you were able to see the Statue of Liberty. Did you go to it? Yes. So we did. We took a boat tour, and... I kind of debated actually taking the tour that takes you to the Statue of Liberty and then you can get out and you can walk around and you can go on top of it or taking a bottomless mimosa brunch tour that floated you right by the Statue of Liberty. So obviously I'm going to go with the latter, more fun. But when that boat got up to the Statue of Liberty, it was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. I was so captivated by it. You know, one day I'd love to go back and maybe go on it, but I was really, really looking forward to this and it did not disappoint at all. Yeah, I haven't actually been to it, to it. I've been by it via the Staten Island boat and also looking across to it from crossing the Brooklyn Bridge on foot. But I would love to do the tour to it. I know you can climb up in it. That would be amazing. And this was actually a gift that was made in Paris. And it was a gift from France on the 100-year anniversary of American independence. So that's pretty cool. So there's yeah. a lot of historical aspects to it. Um, on top of that, it's supposed to embody like friendship, peace, progress, and the historical alliance between France and the United States. So when I go back to New York, this is definitely on my to-do list to go and do like an actual tour of the Statue of Liberty. Yeah, I think it's a must-do if you're in New York. We have two episodes on New York. One is episode 25. The other is episode 216, where I talk about that bottomless brunch cruise out to the Statue of Liberty. So if you're more interested in checking that out, go listen. Number six on our UNESCO World Heritage Site list in the U.S. is going to be the Grand Canyon, falling under the natural category of UNESCO designations. And who doesn't know the Grand Canyon? I think everybody in the world knows the Grand Canyon. Yeah, I've actually been a few times. We've been on a squad trip to the Grand Canyon. Jamal and I went to Monument Valley with Jamal's sister, Najwa. We did a pit stop at the Grand Canyon because she had never been. We went, one of the days we went at sunrise. Wow, that was a beautiful experience. It was worth getting up for sunrise. I know, Kim, you love those early mornings with me. You would have just loved (laughs) it. But super beautiful, tons of gorgeous hiking there, just the natural a rock formations and seeing all of the layers of the canyon is just really beautiful. We actually had went after a kind of like a big storm. And so the entrance to the Grand Canyon that we needed to get into was closed at the start of our trip. And so I think I ended up moving some things around to make Grand Canyon like the last thing we did. And it like opened up the day before the entrance that we needed to go through opened up the day before. And as we drove through the park and we drove the rim drive, we got to see a ton of different outlooks and stuff. There was so much snow. It was blanketed with snow on the edges. And it was really just like a unique experience because a lot of times when you see the Grand Canyon, it is dry, it's hot, all of that. But to see it freshly blanketed in snow was pretty cool. 
I wholeheartedly agree. I think to see it in that type of environment that's completely different than what everyone thinks, which is that desert environment, which it has, but a lot of people, again, don't realize sometimes that the desert gets really cold. So to see it dusted and blanketed with snow was really cool. But what I really enjoy most about the Grand Canyon is just really looking at it and thinking of the passage of time that has taken place in this one location that you can really see, right? The Grand Canyon was created literally over millions of years of the Colorado River running through this area and just etching its way across the landscape to create layer and layer and layer. And it makes me think how big was this river at one point in time and how much different was the climate. I mean, the canyon goes as deep as one mile. So you're standing at the top and you could look one mile down in. At its narrowest, it's a third of a mile across, but at its farthest width, it's 18 miles. So just to really see the passage of time, just looking at one location and one specific thing, I think is impressive and really can experience that a lot of places on earth, if anywhere else. I think Grand Canyon is one of those parks that everyone has to visit at least once because it is so iconic. We don't actually have a dedicated episode on the Grand Canyon, which I'm very surprised by given that you guys have gone a couple times now. But we did talk about it on episode eight for the American Southwest Road Trip which I highly recommend, by the way. It's a fantastic road trip, and it puts you into the Grand Canyon as well as some really cool stuff that is also nearby. You can extend your trip out for a little bit longer, so get yourself a two for three for with that one. And if you really like that episode, we do have an itinerary on our website with that exact trip outlined on it, so definitely go check it out. Number seven, we're going tropical with this one and headed to Hawaii volcanoes for this natural UNESCO World Heritage Site. Yes, and since we're talking about past squad episodes that we've had here, talking about these locations, this is episode 45, so a lot of these harken way back when, but still classics, but goodies. And Brittany and I talk about all our adventures at Hawaii Volcanoes National Park, which is located on Big Island, Hawaii. And we visited here in March of 2020. And this was actually a place that we probably were not going to be going to anytime soon, but developed because a trip that we had got canceled because of COVID, right? If you heard me say March 2020, that was kind of like the onset of it. Brittany and I were supposed to go to Hong Kong. And of course, we know what happened. We weren't able to do that. Our airline said, where else do you want to go? We started thinking about it and we're like, oh, well, let's just go to Hawaii. And we did that. And it's one of those unfortunate things that happened, but fortunate in the sense that we got to experience this awesome UNESCO World Heritage Site. Yeah, I actually really liked Big Island in Hawaii. And the Volcanoes National Park actually has two of the most active and accessible volcanoes in the world. So that's really cool. The volcanic eruptions, they constantly change the landscape. And so while we were there, some areas of the park are actually closed off because of previous activity. Some are, you know, open and you can hike. And one of the hikes that we did, we actually got to hike across a caldera floor. And it's just so unique because when you hike across it, it's just like gray, black, barren. And it just feels so eerie because in Hawaii, with like that fog layer coming through with like that tropical weather, it was just a unique hiking situation. Like I've never seen a landscape quite like it. You almost feel like you're in outer space in a way. It was really incredible. And it's really hard to describe unless you did it. I mean, Brittany hit the nail on the head with that description. But one thing she forgot to mention in that description, minus the eeriness of the caldera and just the blackness of the solidified lava that you could walk across and the fog that's really basically cloud cover because you're so high up in the mountains, which is the volcano, is that to get down to that, you're walking through the jungle, right? Yeah, and Hawaii is tropical. So you're in this green, lush environment, and then you come across this edge of where the caldera starts. And then all of a sudden, it's this black feeling that's almost like a beautiful death is how I would kind of describe it, deathly look, because it's just all black and you know it's like fire and brimstone, so to speak. But- Really impressive, really cool, and I, I can't say enough about Hawaii Volcanoes National Park and this UNESCO World Heritage Site. Lots of really cool things, and people should really be going here if you're making your way to Hawaii. 
Yeah, you can see steam vents. You could see the volcanoes. You can hike across the caldera floor. You can see and walk through lava tubes, which are really cool. We did walk through that. If you go through one, definitely have a headlamp with you. Volcanoes is actually pretty remote on the island as well. And when you're driving through like, the actual town of like Volcano, there's no street lamps or anything. So it gets really dark, really eerie. And so it was just a really unique experience. We had some of the best Thai food actually in Volcano Ooh. outside of the National Park. And I would recommend staying there to hit it up for two days. I think that's a great amount of time to spend in this National Park and UNESCO World Heritage Site. Very cool. So moving on to number eight, we actually are going to talk about the San Antonio Mission. This is a cultural UNESCO World Heritage Site. And the squad made a little squad trip here on a trip that we were visiting Kim in Austin. We did a little day trip to San Antonio. And you say the San Antonio Mission, maybe it's better known as the Alamo, right? Everyone's heard of the Alamo. That is the San Antonio Mission. And most people have heard of the Alamo vaguely know the story of the Alamo, but the Alamo was a mission that was built along the San Antonio River Basin. And basically, there's a notorious battle that took place here between, I don't want to even say American forces because it wasn't really the army, but it was against Americans and then the Mexican army when this was still fought over land. And so it's just become this one famous spot in terms of American lore because of the battle that took place here. I got to be honest, it was a little underwhelming from the outside. I was going to say, I completely agree. We didn't go inside of it. We just saw the outside and hi, it was a little underwhelming. The outside was underwhelming. I know we say this all the time. You don't really get the appreciation unless you do the tour. I don't remember if we were on a time constraint or why we didn't do it or we were just like, oh, we'll go check it out because it's so close to the river walk that we were doing when we were in San Antonio. But the grounds and the inside go back a lot further and there's more stuff, right? So just what you can see from the street and the public view is not very impressive, but on the inside it is. So we put this list because we have been to it, but it's one of those things where we have not been inside to do the tour. So if any of you squaddies have actually done that, chime in. DM us, let us know your thoughts about it so that we can share it with people and just get excited for ourselves. But the good news is San Antonio is not too far from Austin, and I see us going back there one of these days when we go to visit you, Kim, to just check it out. You know, I think we decided not to go in for two reasons. One, it was a little underwhelming from the outside, and two, because we went in October, and in October it's still really hot. And so we had been walking around in 90 degree weather and we didn't want to go in and continue walking around in the sun. So keep that in mind if you do visit this place. Try to go when it's a little bit cooler so you really can enjoy it. But I think this is still a really great place to visit. If you are going to be in San Antonio, you're probably going to do the River Walk, which is a really cool area here. And then right outside of the Alamo or the San Antonio Mission, it's very bustling. There's food vendors and music and street performers and people gathering. So it's kind of changed in the draw of what it is. Yes, people are coming for the mission, but it's just a really fun area to hang out in too. Number nine on the list is a place that we all love. Great Smoky Mountains National Park, which falls under the natural category of UNESCO designations. I love this national park. When I visited here, separate from you two, it was in November, so all of the leaves were orange, red, yellow, fall colors, cold weather, mountain vibes, so, so pretty. That smokiness that came with the mountains and the trees, it's so pretty. And I mean, it's not like it's some crazy mountain that, you know, you've never seen mountains like this before, but it does have a little something special to it that you really have to feel and see to believe. Yeah, and it's really hard to describe what that is, but you're so right with that, Kim. You just get this feeling of like, this area is special. And you don't know what it is that makes you feel that way, but it just has that vibe to it. Yeah, the Great Smoky Mountains was so beautiful. We actually visited in May of 2022, Jamal and I, and... I'm really jealous of Kim's experience because Kim's experience was getting some of that fall foliage colors. And I would love to go back during like peak fall season. That would be amazing. I think some of the lookouts would be just crazy to see. 
But we went when it was all green, still really cool. We got to see the smokiness of the mountains. Of course, that's all of the like collective vapor that the trees kind of like exhale and creates that blanket of fog above them, giving them that like smoky haze. But the Great Smoky Mountains is one of the most ecologically rich and diverse temperate zones that is actually protected in the entire world. There's so many different plant species within it, so many different types of trees. And it's just like very diverse in its flora and fauna. And not only that, just right outside the park is a really cool town that you can go to, Gatlinburg. You know, speaking of the flora and fauna, it's actually known to have a lot of black bears that have a really high black bear concentration. It's not uncommon in the town of Gatlinburg, just right outside of the Smokies, for those black bears to come roaming through the town. So I don't want to say a bear sighting's guaranteed because it's nature. You never really know, just kind of like how we we're talking about earlier with Kim and the Gators and uh, Crocs never really kind of happening. But uh, you have a high chance of seeing bears when you're out here in the Smoky Mountains just as well. We actually hiked the Alum Cave Bluffs to Myrtle Point. And it was an 11-mile hike. But while we were on that hike, we saw a mama bear and her two baby cubs on our way up and then on the way back down they were still there and we got to watch the two baby bears climb down the tree it was the cutest thing to watch them scurry down the tree so that was really cool i really would recommend that hike and another spot in the park to visit is called clingman's dome it's the highest peak in the park you can actually drive most of the way up on this road and then you only have to hike like half a mile but it's the highest peak in the park It gives you 360 degree scenic views and you actually cross the border of two states. So that's pretty cool. And you're on part of the Appalachian Trail. I'm glad you actually mentioned that about Klingsman Dome because I was just thinking about it. You know, we love the Smoky Mountains. So in our head amongst all three of us, we're just thinking, oh, yeah, people know where this is. Right. But the Smokies is really known to be in the state of Tennessee. But the Smoky Mountains also span into North Carolina. So Clingman's Dome is an overlook that straddles the state line within the Smokies of Tennessee as well as North Carolina, and the famous Appalachian Trail runs right through there on that state line. So it's a really unique and awesome spot and a really good area to go at sunset because that's what we did. And so we weren't there during fall time, but it kind of gave it that little fall color vibe because I'm seeing those purples and reds in the sky kind of transitioning to the trees, which was really, really beautiful. I'll just say one last thing about the Great Smoky Mountains, and that is to go up on the gondola, you can get on in Gatlinburg and it will take you up. And there's this really cool bridge walk, sitting areas with fireplaces, and you can get drinks up there. And the view is just amazing. You can see the whole Smoky Mountains, all the trees, the teeny tiny town of Gatlinburg like carved out in the middle of it. It's such a cool view. I would highly recommend doing that. And I would also highly recommend going back to episode 156. We have that whole episode dedicated to Great Smoky Mountains National Park. So if you're going to visit and we highly recommend you do, listen to that episode first. Awesome. So we are moving on to number 10 on our list, which is actually Mammoth Cave National Park. It's one of those natural UNESCO World Heritage Sites again, and it's located in the state of Kentucky. Jamal and I visited in February of 2021, and they do have guided and self-guided tours available. We were able to do two tours. Both of them were guided at the time. And so they range from like $8 to $25 per person. They have over 10 different tours to choose from. But I think what was most unique about Mammoth Cave National Park is whenever you think of a cave, you're thinking of those stalagmites, stalactites, those different cave structures that you're used to. And we walked into Mammoth Cave National Park, which is the most extensive cave system in the entire world. It has over 285 miles. And when we walked in, it was like completely barren. There was no stalagmites, no stalactites. It just felt like, and this is exactly what happened, there was a big underground river and it created this passageway and it's like this big whole cave, but not with those same structures. It's almost like it's a carved tunnel is really what it felt like. Thank you. That's right. And what makes this cave even more unique, right, in terms of the natural aspect of it, to what Brittany said, is those 
caves that you're used to seeing, the stalagmites, stalactites, it's basically created by water dripping through the limestone, and then it's the deposits that create those structures as the water is dripping. But this cave doesn't even have any of that whatsoever. It really was an underground river. And it's designated as a natural UNESCO World Heritage Site, but I dare say that it could even be a cultural one because on the tour, it was very, very interesting. You know, they give you a lot of history in here. I mean, they've discovered bodies in here that they can date back to Native Americans going back 5,000 years deep into the cave, too. So imagine, you know, before people had headlamps, lights, you know. They just had fire sticks. They just had fire sticks going into here. So they don't know what they were doing in there. Was it shelter? Was it a home? Was it a sacred site, etc.? But on top of that, this cave is known to actually have a substance that was used to make gunpowder. And they were talking on this tour. Our ranger was letting us know that if it wasn't for Mammoth Cave, America may not even be a country anymore. Because after our War of Independence that we were talking about, you know, or when we were talking about Independence Hall earlier, the War of 1812 is when the UK and British Empire said, forget this, we're going to try to go ahead and take it back. Well, they were the largest seller of gunpowder to the United States. But why would they sell gunpowder to the enemy that they are actually fighting? So they stopped selling it to us, but they had an abundance of it here in this cave. So Mammoth Cave is where they were harvesting to create gunpowder that we used in the War of 1812 to actually win and keep our independence as a separate country. So it could even potentially fall as a cultural designation here because this cave kept America alive and well. And it's the oldest cave tour in the U.S. as well. And they had these TB hospitals down in this cave where they like segregated people with TB because they thought that they were going to be cured in this underground environment. So well, what's TB, Brittany? You're saying TB, but let the, all the non-nursing people and medical professionals know. <laughs> <laughs> it did not end up curing tuberculosis. People still, you know, had it, died, all of that. But it was such an interesting tour to hear all of the different things about the artifacts that they found, how it was significant to the U.S. history, just everything about it. We did go in the height of COVID. We went in February 2021, so not all of the tours were operating. So I would even love to go back and explore more of the cave tours that they have. That would be really cool. The actual park, Mammoth Cave National Park, there is you know land on the outside of it or on top of it. You can explore all of that at any time for free. So if you wanted to hike in that area, we didn't hike in the area because we went specifically for the cave. If you're going to a national park or a UNESCO site called Mammoth Cave, I want to go inside the cave and not hike, if you can imagine that. Yeah. It's like going to Carlsbad Cavern and being like, let me just do a trail on the desert on top. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so we did an episode on this one too, way back, episode 92. If you want to go here, definitely go listen to that. And you'll also get a little bonus, Jamal shitting on Nashville. <laughs> so if if you do go back to this one, I think you need a Nashville redemption as well. Maybe. Now that I know what I'm getting into when I go to Nashville and that Broadway's only two blocks long, <laughs> maybe I could have a different appreciation for it. I wouldn't call it shitting, but you know, I think I think the squaddies appreciate when Jamal says it like it is or how he feels. <laughs> and that's the great thing about our podcast is that we have three different opinions on it. So what do we know Jamal doesn't like? Um, you know, not a huge fan of Maui, Maui in terms of uh, other Hawaiian islands. Cold water. The Denver airport. Denver airport and apparently <laughs> Nashville. Yes, we should do a whole episode on things Jamal doesn't like. That would be hilarious. Well, Jamal rants. <laughs> I'll pull a rant all day on that one. He's definitely going to have a freak out in that one. Yes. <laughs> All right. Number 11 UNESCO World Heritage Site is one of my personal favorites, and that is Olympic National Park in Washington. It is up in that Pacific Northwest corner. So as you can imagine, it is in the natural category for UNESCO. I love this place. We as a squad visited here back in September 2021. I had been here once without the squad before that. Loved it both times. It's so pretty. There's moss everywhere. There's green trees everywhere. Like everything is green. When I went that first time without y'all, it was also like foggy and eerie, which just totally added to it. It was it was so pretty. And so I'm talking a lot about the whole rainforest, which is 
one of the most pretty parts of the park, but the whole park is pretty and it has more than just that. I heard there was a lot of romance going on. Like it was really romantic in the Ho Ho Raid Forest at that time of year. Well, they don't call it the Ho Rainforest for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so Olympic National Park, I don't think you said it, Kim. It's in the state of Washington in the Pacific Northwest, kind of along, obviously, the Pacific Ocean, right? So it's known to be a forest that gets that fogginess that comes in that you're talking about. And that fogginess then creates a lot of moisture, which keeps it very green. And on top of just the trees being green themselves, then it creates that layer of moss, on the bark and trees and moss even on the rocks and so you can see it at the bottom of the water of the creeks and rivers that are flowing through it so it just has this abundance of green and a unique forest environment that i've never experienced in my life that i really appreciated when we were here in olympic yeah so olympic has a lot to offer you know obviously the whole rainforest but they categorize it as seashore to glacier so it does touch the coastal forest we actually went out on the beach you can see those rock formation those sea stacks you can see that driftwood all of that there's a lot of waterfalls in the national park as well you get to hike through dense forest canopy and like jamal said like the moss covered rocks i think it was just a really beautiful and unique national park we saw so many different areas of it we did some really cool trails too so you know there's lakes there's creeks, there's waterfalls, there's the ocean, there's a whole rainforest. There's a lot to see and explore in this one national park. And I would love to go back and explore even more of it. My biggest disappointment when we were here is that it wasn't foggy and have that eeriness vibe to it that you got to experience. I thought you were going to say your biggest disappointment was that you didn't make it to the top of Mount Storm Keem. Oh, no, that's not what I was going to say. I I'm glad I walked out of there with my life. <laughs> so that's OK. <laughs> and if you want to know that reference of to what Brittany's talking about, go back and listen to our episode about Olympic National Park to get more information uh, on it. Episode 68. Number 12 on our list, though, is going to be the Redwoods. Redwoods State Park, Redwoods National Park, located in Northern California, along the coast, almost like Olympic National Park, where the forest meets the ocean, and this is a natural UNESCO designation. Yeah, we actually just visited this year. We went in June 2023, and I love the redwoods. It's the tallest trees in the world. And so when you are standing at the base of the tree looking up, sometimes you can't even like see the top because all of the branches from below are blocking and it just, it looks so crazy. And it's like, how, how are these are so tall? And some of them are pretty skinny and tall too. So it's like, how do they stand so tall on their own and not just get knocked over with the wind? But we did some really cool hiking in Redwoods National Park. We did the James Irvine Trail to Fern Canyon. It was an easy 11 to 12 miles round trip. <laughs> there was actually another way to get to Fern Canyon, which was actually the park right next to it. But you had to have permits. And when we went, all of the permits were sold out. So we just had to hike, you know, the 11 to 12 miles round trip to get it. I think when I went there and we did Fern Canyon, that must have been what we did because we did just park and walk in. But it was so long ago that, I don't know, maybe permits weren't needed at that time. Maybe we didn't have permits. I was saying earlier how sometimes you don't realize you're even in a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And this was one of those cases for me. I did this hike. I didn't even realize I was in the Redwood National Park. And so now, I, like you, I want to go back and redo it and fully appreciate it. Yeah, because Bernie said we just visited in June 2023, which we did. That was our most recent visit. It's not the first time Brittany and I have been. And I'm trying to remember, we do have an episode of the Redwoods that we did. We did not. We, do not. we did not record it. So we were talking about another time. Not yet. I remember I was re-listening to a previous episode a while ago, and I can't remember which one it was because apparently I thought it was Redwoods. But you were saying, Kim, that I haven't been to Redwoods. And then we were talking about it. And you're like, oh, Fern Canyon, because Brittany mentioned it, how she wanted to do it. And you're like, no, 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 I have been there, right? So you didn't, yeah. you didn't realize you were there, but you were there. But beyond Fern Canyon, like Brittany said, what makes the Redwoods the Redwoods is these are the tallest trees in the world. The Redwoods and Sequoias are kind of like a hybrid family of trees. And so the sequoias are known to be the largest in terms of the width, which they are not here in this park. But the redwoods 
even though they're the tallest, they are not as wide, but some of those trees trunks still are very, very wide, yet some are very, very narrow. So you see this whole range of different redwood trees, nonetheless, all tall. I mean, the tallest tree in the park, its name is Hyperion, 380 feet tall. They keep the location of this tree a secret because they don't want so many people to go there and actually disturb the environment that it's in. But I mean, it, 380 is the tallest, but it's not uncommon for lots of trees to top 300 feet in this park. So regardless of seeing Hyperion or not, you're going to be impressed when you're in here. Number 13 on our list of UNESCO World Heritage Sites in the U.S. is Yellowstone National Park. It's another natural UNESCO site, and it's primarily located in Wyoming, but it does also spread in, into Montana and Idaho. We did a squad trip here in June of 2020. We actually went in the day that the park opened up. And, you know, I've heard different things about Yellowstone. I've heard people say it's overhyped. It's like a natural outdoor amusement park with how many people. But we had a totally, completely different experience. We had the park almost alone by ourselves. And we got to enjoy all of the areas that we wanted to without feeling like that rush and that pressure from other people there. So I think we had a really unique experience. But beyond that, Yellowstone is amazing. There's all of those geological formations and geothermal forces and all of the beautiful geysers and waterfalls and just like all of those mud pots and what are they called where it's just like the like the grand prismatic that big those big hot springs that are thermal pools with all of the different bacteria and things that grow inside of them. You said that some people think that Yellowstone is overhyped. I have to strongly disagree with that. It lives up to the hype. It definitely lives up to the hype, and I don't want to get sidetracked, but when we're done talking about Yellowstone before we move on to our final 14, I want to see where Yellowstone stacks to number one that you claimed earlier, Kim, which is going to be Mesa <laughs> Verde National Park. But when Brittany's alluding to the fact that we went right when it opened, we had it all to ourselves, the date she said was June 2020, right? They closed the national parks at the start of COVID. We went literally a day or two after they opened the national park the that back is. up. People still weren't traveling, and it's not like they just opened the parks and were like, let's just fly out there. We actually had plans to be in Yellowstone at this time. We didn't know if we were going to make it because we had our plans to be here and do this squad trip well, well in advance before COVID even happened, before anyone had that thought. I mean, we were planning this early 2019, right? So we had a unique experience that probably no one else in the world will experience again is having Yellowstone pretty much without all the crazy amounts of people that are known to visit and frequent this national park, but for the very reasons that we just mentioned, right? I mean, you have the wildlife, the highest concentration of grizzly bears in the United States outside of Alaska is here in Yellowstone Park. The geysers, more than half of the world's geysers are located here in Yellowstone. So there's so much uniqueness to this in terms of wildlife, geological that just make this park special and of course no doubt of the a unesco world heritage site but kim where does yellowstone rank then in comparison to mesa verde uh, such a hard question so mesa verde obviously number one number two and three <laughs> i'm kind not. of going back and oh absolutely not <laughs> but number two and three i'm kind of torn between yellowstone and olympic national park they're so different but they're both so unique and incredibly beautiful i i, I think i have to put yellowstone and you put carlsbad and the cavern oh, there's just so many good ones to choose from you you spoke too soon. I mean, we know ancient ruins and things like that get you going, and Mesa Verde was listed as number <laughs> one, so I think you were just over-eager as we got into the episode, but we're going to have to put in the show notes maybe Kim's official rankings on this once the <laughs> reconsideration happens. <laughs> yes, yeah. So number 14 and the final UNESCO in the United States that we are going to talk about is Yosemite National Park. Also, another natural UNESCO designation. Yosemite is up there with Yellowstone, if you want me to be honest. It's one of the crown jewels of the U.S. national park system. It's located in California's Central Valley in the Sierra Nevada Mountains. And Yosemite is just known for its exceptional beauty 
including five of the world's highest waterfalls and a combination of granite domes and walls and steep incised valleys. So it's just known for that natural rugged landscape in the Sierra Nevada mountains. And if you want to hear all about Yosemite, we have an actual episode dedicated to it. It's episode 166. And I love Yosemite. It's one of those national parks that I've been to so many times. I was actually in FFA in high school, Kim and I both, future farmers of America, baby, represent. (laughs) We went to Yosemite every single year on our way to our state championship to compete for vegetable crops judging. Yep, that's right. We used to judge vegetables. So represent. (laughs) We used to go to Yosemite every year during part of that trip. I've also been with my family. I've been with Jamal several times. We've never been as a squad, but there is just so much to do in Yosemite. There's areas of it people don't even really realize. Like there is an area called Hetch Hetchy where we discovered a really cool waterfall that's back there. Almost no one goes to that area. Almost everyone goes to Yosemite Valley. And, you know, Yosemite is really known for like half dome and those really tall granite domes and structures that you can hike for. It's a hiker's paradise. We've done so many good hikes there. I think one of my favorite trails, I'll name two. One is the trail to the upper Yosemite Falls. And the other would be the Mist Trail, that which goes past like Vernal and Nevada Falls. And Yosemite is getting, I mean, it's always been a popular part, but it's getting to almost be at the... Yellowstone levels in terms of crowds. I know even just seeing this year, and again, California had historic snowfall this year, which has been great getting us out of the drought, but it created people wanting to see Yosemite in an environment that they'll probably never see again in their lives or just haven't seen in a while with that much snow because it's been literally almost two decades now since we've had a substantial amount of snow. But I'm seeing lines in the cars taking at least two hours to get into the park from the the gate station for this year, right? So if you're going to go, just plan accordingly, know for that, but definitely worth the visit. And I want to touch upon a little bit more of what Brittany was saying to Hetch Hetchy Valley. It touches all together, right? Yosemite Valley and Hetch Hetchy, but the valley eventually ends in a dead end and that's the famous area. So there's not a road that you can get to it. So it's a separate road far away to get you to a part that touches Yosemite, but the only way to get to it is that separate road. And not a lot of people go there and it's a unique spot to really go uh, and see a different part of the park that most people don't get to experience and really cool waterfalls. Like Brittany said over there too, not as grand as in the valley, but a unique experience nevertheless. I like this park. I've been once before. I thought it was very beautiful. Saw a bear. That was very exciting. It ran right by me. I'll never forget it. And I think this park also has something for the people that don't necessarily want to hike. We had this one on our list of one of the best national parks to visit if you don't like hiking because there are a lot of good viewpoints and things to do out there. I'm actually toying with the idea of visiting here in November around Thanksgiving time. So I'm kind of considering going home for Thanksgiving, which is up near Sacramento. And you know, it's only a couple hours drive into Yosemite from there. Louis's sister took a culinary position, a sous chef type position at a luxury type resort in Yosemite. And so we're playing around with the idea of maybe spending a day or two there. Well, if you're toying around with that idea and don't mind Brittany and I tagging along, keep us in consideration (laughs) because we need to do a squad trip there. I was going to say before you said that, let's maybe try to look into a spring one because I think squad trip here would be really fun. And Yosemite is a national park that never gets old going to. You could appreciate it on your millionth time there if you're fortunate enough to go that many times. All right. Well, let's dive into cool questions of the week. We have one question coming in. Is there a U.S. UNESCO site that you haven't visited yet but want to? I think Jamal definitely knows this one. I see Brittany lighting up. I think she has one. Yeah, I'll go ahead and go first. So my UNESCO site that I haven't visited yet but I would would love to visit is the Waterton Glacier International Peace Park. It is... Mm -hmm. A combination of the national park in the U.S., Glacier National Park, and Waterton National Park up in Canada, 
and they meet on that Montana Canada border of the U.S. and Canada. And there's like this little peace park. I would love to go there and experience that UNESCO site. Very cool. This is a tough question because even myself, I don't even know all of the UNESCO heritage sites in the U.S. For me, I'm going to have to say Glacier Bay National Park and Preserve, which is located in Juneau, Alaska. Brittany and I have been to Alaska before on an Alaska cruise, but we didn't unfortunately get to go to this national park and preserve. But I think it would be a unique experience to just go and see the glaciers as they're coming off of land, flowing into the ocean, taking a cruise on the little inlets of islands, and just really seeing all of this. And that's what you can expect to see at Glacier Bay. So for me, I would have to say that that's my number one of U.S. UNESCO's that I want to make it to next. I definitely want to see Hawaii volcanoes. You all went there. I have not. And I would also love to go to the University of Virginia. (laughs) <laughs> the University of Virginia. Why the university? Ironically, it's listed on here as a UNESCO. Do you know why? Yes. So the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, as well as the Monticello Plantation, were designed by Thomas Jefferson. So for that reason, it has the cultural heritage that qualifies it as a UNESCO heritage site. I think it's also unique because it's one of the only ones that's not a national park. There's a couple others that are natural, like the one you just mentioned, Brittany. But hey, University of Virginia showing up. Uh, Yeah, and it's on there as cultural. I mean, only a few of the lists that we went over on the 14 that we discussed, you're right, all cultural. Most of them were the natural ones. So, and, And that's really interesting to think even a university making this list. You could think World Heritage Sites, universities, maybe in Europe for whatever reason. But yeah, in the U.S., I find that to be very intriguing. I don't know high on my list to see, but intriguing nevertheless. <laughs> yeah, if I'm in Virginia, if I'm in the area. So squaddies, when this episode comes out, we are going to do a post for the episode. In the comments, comment what UNESCO World Heritage Site is your favorite. Let us know if you agree with Kim on her number one, two, three, and four four-way tie or not. <laughs> And let us know what site you haven't visited yet, but you want to. Just give us all the scoop on what you're thinking about of these U.S. UNESCO sites. And thank you so much for tuning into our episode this week. Keep the adventures going with us by following us on Instagram, YouTube, TikTok at Travel Squad Podcast. Tag us in your adventures and send us in your questions of the week. If you found the information in this episode to be useful, or if you thought we were just plain funny, please be sure to share it with a friend that would enjoy it too. And as always, guys, please subscribe, rate and review our podcast, and tune in every Travel Tuesday for new episodes. Stay tuned for next week's episode. We have some more amazing adventures and tips in store for you. Bye, Bye, squaddies. Bye, squaddies.